But last week we began to look at the weighty messages or the burden <clears throat> that the Lord had called Isaiah to be able to speak. And initially the speaking would be towards Babylon. And so I remind you of that in chapter 13 and verse 19. Uh, before we move into our chapter 14 and continue in the oracle, that's what's used in the Old King James or New King James, the burden that Isaiah had of being able to present this message before um, the people there in Israel about Babylon. It says in chapter 13, verse 19, and Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, it was the place to be. It was the city, if you will, when the Babylonians were conquering the known world at the time. He says, the glory of kingdoms and the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, listen to what he says, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And so it would be, again, Old Testament prophecy coming to fulfillment should spur us, should excite us, should, if you will, give us confidence in the yet-to-come prophecies that we have not seen. This prophecy was given some 200 years before the Babylonians would even become a superpower and start to work their way through the known world and conquering it. And so they were destroyed, as the Bible says they would be, by the Medo-Persian Empire and its armies. And since that time, it has really been in ruins, and there have been... Uh, none that have lived in the city. Uh, just with that thought, let me just again prepare you as we move into the continuation of the burden against Babylon uh, that we are reminded prophecy that has been given to us is to help us in being able to have confidence in those prophecies that have yet not come. And let me make one real clear. Jesus is coming again. Amen. Amen. He's coming again. And the prophecies of old are to help prepare us and to ready us for that prophecy. Everything pointing to the Messiah and his coming and then, of course, his coming again. We know that he's coming again two different ways. The first time he will come to be able to call up the church and to meet him in the air, the word says. John 14 makes that very clear. And then he's coming again to be able to judge all those that continue to rebel against him in his second coming. And we have that spoken to us and very clearly in Matthew 24 and 25 and, of course, in Revelation throughout. So we move to chapter 14 with those thoughts in mind. The Lord has already rebuked <coughs> Babylon and is continuing in chapter 14 as we move but the first two verses are special here look at them with me it says this for the lord will have mercy on jacob and will still choose israel and settle them in their land the strangers will be joined with them and they will cling to the house of jacob then people will take them and bring them to their place and the house of Israel will possess them for servants and maids in the lands of the Lord. And they will take them captive, whose captives they were, and rule over their oppressors. And so how cool is it in the middle of this, if you will, burden that Isaiah is speaking out against Babylon, that he says, listen, I know God's going to judge Babylon, but God also wants you to hear this Israel in the midst of giving you the promise that one day this is going to take place. He reassures the Israelites that they would go through different times, difficult times, but that he would always have his hand on the remnant, showing them to be the chosen children of God. Psalm 135 and verse 4 says it this way. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his special treasure.
treasure. And I want you to notice that both of those names are mentioned here in our passage in Isaiah, both Jacob and Israel. And that is because all 12 tribes are included in that covenant promise that God made to Abraham. And so, yes, Israel has joined forces with Syria. They've come against Judah, as both of them have been split apart. But God says that one day they are going to be reunited. And I find it especially interesting that God says, I will still, look at with me, choose Israel. Because there's an important precept that we need to grab a hold of here. And that is that even after the terrible failures of Israel, remember the ten tribes to the north, have become pagan worshiping nations. They have become those that have followed after all the, the pagan worshipers that are around them and have become a part of, if you will, the pagan worship themselves. Even after all the terrible failures that have happened, I love that what God says is that he still chooses them. I want to make sure we hear that because it's so important that we recognize that even if we have failed the Lord miserably in the past, that when one turns from their wickedness, when one turns from their sinfulness, the Lord still chooses us. What a blessing that is to be able to hear. Let me remind you, Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. And then, of course, 1 John, in chapter 1, in verse 9, the Lord uses the Apostle Paul to tell us that if we confess, or John to tell us if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is a great thought for us to be able to have this morning because we all fail the Lord, don't we? There is none here that's perfect. No one has arrived. And so we need to recognize God still chooses us. What a blessing it is to have the amazing grace of Almighty God that we sang about already this morning being shown to us for Israel even as we travel through this passage. One more thing to notice, I think, important that we also are included in that verse. Look back up at chapter 14 as we look at those two verses. It says, and the stranger will be joined with them. Or the Lord says, the Gentile believer, that is you and I, unless you come from Jewish heritage, you and I as Gentile believers will be joined with the chosen children of God. What an amazing blessing that is. And so in the midst of this burden, in the midst of this rebuke and the telling of the uh, destruction and judgment that's going to come to Babylon, the Lord allows for Isaiah to say, wait a minute, make sure, Israel, you understand who you are in the midst of this judgment that is going to come upon uh, Babylon. And then he goes into the continuation and the fall of Babylon. He says in verse 3, look at it with me, it shall come to pass in the day the Lord gives you rest from your sorrow and from your fear and <clears throat> the hard bondage in which you were made to serve. And so the promise again to the Israelites is that they were going to be uh, taken out of the bondage, the captivity of the Babylonians who would uh, persecute them and, and use them as slaves. But the Lord says, I I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to give you a, a time of being able to no longer have the sorrow or the fear. Look what he says, or the hard bondage. Three things that are mentioned here that are important for us to be able to think about. And once again, let us remember that when we look at Hebrew prophecy, it has a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. And so he's speaking up about Babylon, literally Babylon, the Babylon that's in Iraq, the city of Babylon, the, the place that the that the empire would be raging from. And then he's also speaking about spiritual Babylon, 
or if you will, the whole of the evil way of the world. And so remember that as, as we go through this. And look with me at what he says you're going to be freed from, because it's very important that we see that. We're going to be freed from sorrow, fear, and bondage. And that's the promise that we all have when we put our trust in Jesus Christ. And so he's saying, listen, when Babylon's conquered, you're going to be freed from, the Jews would be freed from. Remember, Cyrus would allow, King Cyrus would allow them to return to the land, and they'd be freed from all those things. But when we look into the spiritual Babylon, you and I are freed from those same things when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, freed from sorrow, freed from fear, and freed from bondage. I have no eternal sorrow when knowing Jesus Christ is going to be the one that I will see when I pass from this earth. When I breathe my last breath, I know who I'm going to come face to face with, and I'm excited about the time when he says, welcome in. Very important for us to look at, and the reason that I know that is because I got the great deal. I got forgiven for my sins when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. So there is no more sorrow in my life. Oh, we'll have sorrow of the present day and here on earth, but not eternal sorrow. Our eternal sorrow is secured in great days with the Lord forever. And then he says you're going to be saved from fear, and I have no more fear since accepting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior because I know who's in charge. I know who's still sitting on the throne, and I'm very comfortable with him being the one that is guiding, directing. We'll talk about that a little more when we continue here. And finally, the bondage, and certainly if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know what it's like to be set free from the bondage of sin, to be able to have the power of the Holy Spirit of God working in you to overcome sin and death. And so the blessing that we have of being set free from these things, Jesus said it this way. He said, <clears throat> if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you Free. I'm no longer in bondage because I've been set free in the study of his word. That's why it's so important for us to go through the word of God. And why we go through the word of God the way we do here at Calvary Chapel, Roma Land. Making sure that we're going verse by verse and book by book and we're precept upon precept. Taking a look at the word so that we can know it and be free from sorrow, fear, and and bondage. And I want you to make sure that you recognize that the Lord also says, I will give you rest. And Jesus makes that very clear to us, doesn't he? In Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 11, where he says to us, Come to me, all you who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Lord, Jesus Christ, are ready, ready and willing to give rest to all who place their trust in him. Let's look at verse 4 and 5. That you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How the oppressor has ceased, the golden city ceased, the Lord has broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. And set rulers. So once again, the near and far fulfillment comes into play. The first of all is the real city of Babylon, of course. And its king, the first of whom you remember was King Nebuchadnezzar. And then <clears throat> the second Babylon, which represents the evil world system, also comes into play. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, or it will be done away with. In Revelation chapter 17 and 18, and Babylon's king, Satan himself, being dealt with by the Lord. He says, he who struck the people in wrath with the continual stroke, he ruled the nation in anger, is persecuted, and no one hinders. The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. Indeed, the cypress trees rejoice over you. 
and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since you were cut down, no woodsman has come up against us. And so the near and far fulfillment once again here in front of us as they would come out of the harshness of the Babylonian captivity that was going to take place some 200 years later. And then they would all be rejoicing in this manner and celebrating. But for sure, when we look at this part of the passage that says the whole earth is at rest and quiet, it's looking forward to the thousand year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about it with me for a moment. The word of God is speaking here and says even creation is going to be excited when Satan is overthrown. Even creation. Remember that creation has suffered in the wake of sin as well as all who live on the earth. And so the Lord is using this uh, cypress trees rejoicing to be able to, to show the excitement that is going to take place of everything created when he finally deals with Satan himself. What a blessing it is to be able to see that. Verse 9. Hell from beneath is excited about you. He's speaking now, remember, about Satan being taken down by the Lord. And he says, hell is, from beneath is excited about you, to meet you at your coming. It stirs up the dead for you, all the chief ones of the earth. It is raised up from their thrones, all the kings of the nations. And so peoples would make sure uh, that we need to catch what he is saying here. Hell is real. And a lot of people don't like to hear that. A lot, a lot of churches are not even speaking of it. But the reality is, is that I don't care about being politically correct. I want to be biblically correct. And the word of God speaks very clearly about hell. Turn to Matthew's gospel for a moment. Because I want to make sure that we recognize that is not only the prophets of old, it is not only the apostles, it's Jesus and Christ, Christ himself who speaks about hell being real. And I think it's important for us to be able to recognize that in this passage of scripture, it is made very clear, hell is waiting for Satan. Hell was made for Satan. I want to make sure you hear this because a lot of people are confused about this. They think that Satan is running hell. No, God Almighty is running hell. And hell is a place that was created for Satan and his fallen demons. You have to choose to want to go there by your continued rebellion. It was never intended for mankind. It was intended for Satan and his fallen angels. Look at Matthew in chapter 10 with me for a moment. And verse 28, as we see Jesus speak about hell himself. He says, verse 28 of chapter 10, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We need to recognize Jesus made sure it was very clear that hell is a real place, and it is a place for Satan and his demons and those that continue to rebel against him. Isaiah is just making sure that it's clear. It's a serious rebuke of the king of Babylon. It is a serious rebuke to Satan himself. But believe it, you need to recognize that for the Jews, this was a, a very encouraging for those that were believers moment that the Lord is saying one day, he is going to be dealt with finally. He is going to be dealt with in a manner that he is going to be put into the place that was created for him, the fallen one. And it gave great hope to those in Israel that that day was coming and that they could look forward to it coming as God would deal with Satan once and for all. Let's go back to Isaiah. We're in verse 10. It says, they all shall speak and say to you, have you also become as weak as we? Have you become like us? Your pomp is brought down to show, and the sound of your stringed instruments. The maggot is spread under you, and the worms cover you. 
And so people following the king of Babylon, listen, the literal Babylon, as well as the people following Satan, need to recognize what it's going to be like when they both fall. The king of Babylon thinks that he's all that. He's got the armies around him. He's got the walled city. He thinks that they're impenetrable. But no, Cyrus found a way. We talked about it last time that we were together. He diverted the river that was feeding them water. And, and they went underneath the, the bars that were coming down just to the water line to be able to siege the city and to be able to attack inside. And Babylon fell. And when the king fell, all of those that saw him fall thought, man, you weren't all that. You were nothing that you presented yourself to be. And the Lord is using Isaiah to say the same thing will be taking place when Satan is thrown down by the Lord. People will look and say, how did I fall for your mischief? How did I get involved in following you? How did I think that you were all so powerful? Here, here's a wild thing that you need to think about, church. Now, many times we equate Satan with Jesus. We put him on the same plane. Uh, you, you can follow me on this, right? You ask somebody, give me the first thing that comes to mind when you think of an opposite. You say light, and they say darkness. You say good, they say bad. You say Jesus, they say Satan. No, Jesus and Satan aren't on the same plane. Satan is a created being, and God, Jesus, is the creator. He is the all-present, ever-powerful, almighty God. He is not on the same plane. And we need to recognize that, and that's exactly what God is having Isaiah say. He's saying, man, when, when I throw him down, people are going to go, what the heck was I even thinking? to follow this guy, or to be tricked by him, or to think that he had such power over me. Important for us to be able to see this. And again, Satan in that manner and being shown in that manner gives great hope to those that are in Israel. That Jesus, of course, would be the one that would save them from their sin. That you and I would recognize he is the one that we want to bow down to. Look on with me as we continue. The people that were following the king of Babylon, uh, literally in spiritual Babylon, Babylon, will be just beside themselves when they see that way too many uh, people have placed themselves under his authority and under his power, and one day they will see that he is nothing. Both the king of Babylon and Satan and their resting place. But look at what their resting place is. I think this is important too. The maggot is spread under you and the worms cover you. What a reward, huh? What, what a reward. I mean, think about, I've slept in some bad places, but I've never <laughs> slept on a bed of maggots and worms covering me as my blanket. But that's what the Lord says is going to be the case for Satan himself. Verse 12, as we continue. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. You are weakened. Uh, you weaken the nation. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. And I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, and I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, and on the furthest side of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High, and yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. As we see the fall of Satan, and Isaiah shows us his pride. I've said many times that all sin stems from pride and that is pictured for us here as Isaiah reverts back to the time in which Satan pridefully brought himself before the Lord. I, I think it's really interesting how many times we see the pronoun I mentioned here in Isaiah and looking forward uh, to the future and speaks about Satan and his fall 
from heaven. Once again, look at what it says, Lucifer. Lucifer, the name Lucifer means bright morning star. He was created as a bright worshiper of the Lord God Almighty. And mention of the strings, stringed instruments here. He was one that was, if you will, put in a position of authority for the Lord. But he became so prideful that he had to be cut down to the ground, it says, because it was all about him. Turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel for a moment. And let me take you to another passage that is speaking about it. Ezekiel, in 20, verse 13 in Ezekiel, it's a, another amazing part of Scripture dealing with, um, dealing with the fall of, of Satan and how it, how it all took place. Let me see if I can find myself there in Ezekiel and uh, chapter 28 and verse 13. Let's see. 28 and 13. You were in Eden, the golden, uh, the garden of God, and every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, ox, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbers and pipes were prepared for you on the day that you were created. And you were the anointed cherubim whom covers. I established you. And you were on the holy mountain of God and you walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stone. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were, you were created, underline, until iniquity was found in you. Until the day of pride. Until the day of pride. And I want to make sure that as we go back to Isaiah, please with me, make sure that you recognize that, that the pride of Satan was to elevate himself above all the others. It was not to be God or equal with God. It was to be able to ele elevate himself above all the other stars, which meant it was to be above all the other angels. And, and so it is, the, it is the propensity of man to try and elevate themselves above others. You need to be careful. The Word of God and we singing this morning was all about being humble before the Lord. Being able to esteem others better than yourself. And, and the sign of the pride is trying to elevate yourself to a point where you think that you know more, that you're better than, that, that you should be the one. Rather than to recognize that we as a body of Christ, as a family of believers, only have one that we look to, and his name is Jesus. And so we recognize that as we look at this passage of scripture, because again, the root of that pride is his, or the root of the sin is his pride in wanting to be better than all the other stars. Well, we move on, verse 16, it says, Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook the kingdom, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners and all the kings of the nations? All of them sleep in glory, everyone in his own House. And so, church, we see Satan is going to be judged by God. And when we see him judged by God, we will all see his weakness and realize that we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, have always had the authority and power, the ability to be victorious over him. I remind you again from John, 1 John and John writing in chapter 4, he says this, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 
it is a, a, a verse to be able to help us constantly realize that we have the power to overcome the flesh. The power of the Holy Spirit living in us, working in us, if we'll just stop for the moment of temptation and say, Lord, I need your help, the Lord will meet us at that place and give us the victory. You and I just need to not move in haste and to be those that just pray and know that prayer changes things. And allow for God to have his perfect way in strengthening us so that we might have victory over that temptation. Well, verse 19 goes on. But you are cast out of your grave like an, abomination, uh, an abominable branch, like the garment of those who are slain, thrust through with a sword, who go down to the stones of the pit, like a corpse trodden underfoot. You will not be joined with them in the burial, because you have destroyed your land and slain your people. The brood of evil doers shall never be named. Prepared slaughter for the children because of the iniquity of their fathers, lest they rise up and possess the land and fill the face of the world and, uh, with cities. For I will rise up against them, says the Lord of hosts, and I will cut off from Babylon the name of the remnant the offspring and the posterity, says the Lord. I will also make it a possession for the porcupine and marshes and muddy waters, and I will sweep it with its broom of destruction, says the Lord of hosts. And so he finishes this time of speaking about the judgment that's going to come up upon literal Babylon and, of course, we recognize eventually against spiritual Babylon. Little Babylon would be swept away, as the word says, in destruction by uh, the Cyrus, the Medes, and the Persians as they come in and conquer uh, the city and destroy it. And then, of course, he's speaking literally against uh, that Babylon being just broken down. And then to the spiritual Babylon, one day, this evil world system is going to be dealt with by the Lord Jesus, and he is going to sweep it away in a broom, with a broom of destruction, even as he did Babylon back in those days. Well, he moves from this now, and uh, if you will, oracle against Babylon, to speak against Assyria. Look on with me as we continue. He says in verse uh, 24, The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. And as I have purposed, so it shall stand. I will break the Assyrians in my hand, and on my mountains tread them, uh, him underfoot. Then his yoke shall be removed from them, and his burden removed from their shoulders. This is the purpose that is the purpose against, uh, proposed against the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out over all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purpose. And who will annul it? His hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? And so while we remember the time of Isaiah's writing that the Assyrian army, remember with me, the Assyrian army was friends with, partners with Judah. They had called and made a pact between the two of them to fight against Israel from the north and Syria coming to help them to try and overtake Jerusalem. And here comes this burden, or here comes this oracle about the way that, it, it, that God is going to judge the Assyrians. But I want you to remember that God knows all things. And again, hundreds of years before it would take place, God would recognize that what was going to happen was that Assyria would come and help Judah. And they would defeat, they would fend off, Israel and Syria, and they're trying to take over Jerusalem. And then Assyria would conquer the northern tribes. 
and they would take in all the territory of the north, but that wouldn't be enough. The Assyrians wanted it all, and so they would come back wanting to conquer Judah and the south. I want to take you to chapter 37 in Isaiah for a moment and remind you of how the Lord defeated Assyria and allowed for little Judah to be able to still stand in the midst of all the warring that was going on and in the midst of this great, powerful empire of Assyria that was coming against them. Chapter 37, look at verse 36. It says, Then the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when the people arose early in the morning, there were corpses all dead. And so Genechereb, king of Assyria, departed and went away and returned home and remained in Nineveh. You know, there's a great precept that is being spoken here. God would use the Assyrian army to be able to come alongside of Judah when they were warring against Israel and Syria. And he would use them in a powerful way to be able to help war off that, that invasion because they were a part of his will. But as soon as they were no longer a part of his will, then God would deal with them accordingly. This is an incredible, incredible part of the scripture, isn't it? that 185,000 soldiers in one night with one angel were left dead. It's incredible to think about the amount of angels, the number of angels that the Lord has, and the kind of destruction that he could bring with one angel. You remember when Jesus was about to die, he said, hey, listen, if I wanted to, I could call the angels down to take care of it. And we see what one angel can do. I, I think the precept that we want to grab a hold of, though, is we need to learn this from the scenario that's before us. And that is, when we're doing the Lord's will, victories happen. And when we rebel against him, the Lord brings consequences for us to have to deal with. Well, let's go back to Isaiah and continue as we look at Philistia and it being uh, burdened as well. This is the burden which came, verse uh, 28, in the year of King Ahaz died. Do not rejoice, all of you in Philistia, because the rod is struck uh, you, the rod that struck you is broken. For out of the serpent's roots come forth the viper, and its offspring will be bring a fiery serpent. The firstborn of the poor will feed, and the needy will lie down in safety. And I will kill your roots with famine, and it will uh, slay your remnant. Well, O gate, cry, O city, all you of Philistia are dissolved, for smoke will come from the north, and no one will be alone in his appointed time. And so we need to recognize that the Philistines were enemies of Israel forever. And the Lord is speaking out against them. They posi position themselves, what we know today as the Gaza Strip or on the southern coastline of Israel. And, and here we have them with uh, celebrating King uh, Ahaz's death. And the Lord says, you better not... You better not celebrate King Ahaz's death because there is destruction that will come against you as well. And under the siege of the uh, Assyrian army, they would suffer greatly. But isn't it cool how the Lord stands up for his children and he protects Israel, Judah at the time, he protects them and he brings a burden upon the Philistine uh, armies and from the north it says that, the, that they would be attacked, and the attack would be so great with the Assyrian army coming in that the amount of men that were coming would look like smoke coming uh, after them. He uses that analogy. And so from the north, the Assyrians would 
attack the Philistines again. Well, we finish up with verse 32, and it's an important verse that says this. What will they answer the messenger of the nations? That the Lord has founded Zion, and the poor of his people shall take refuge in it. Isaiah says the Lord has founded Zion. He's saying the Lord has founded it. It shall never be destroyed. He's saying no nation, no country, no warring will ever destroy the nation of Israel. And so Isaiah leaves the chapter with us reminding, uh, uh, being reminded of one thing. And look at it with me. He says the poor of his people shall take refuge in it which speaks of God's promise that only those that are humble will enter into the kingdom. I remind you of Matthew 5 and verse 3 where Jesus just said this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The question that we have to ask ourselves is, have we, have we humbled ourselves under the mighty hand of God? Have we placed ourselves in the position of being able to just say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, I'm not perfect. And I know that means that if I'm gonna have a right relationship with a holy God, that I need a savior. And I believe that you, Jesus, are the savior of the world. Only the humble shall enter into the kingdom of God. Father, we come before you and thank you for this morning and your word. Thank you once again, God, that we can look to it and grow in the knowledge and the grace of you. Such an incredible God to be able to give us these prophecies long before they would take place so that we would recognize and understand that the yet prophecies to be fulfilled are going to happen. Knowing that you're real, that heaven is real and hell is real. Knowing that there's only one way into the kingdom, and that is by humbling ourselves under the hand of Almighty God, by giving way to the one and only, you said it, Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. Giving way to you, being our Lord. This morning, if there's anyone here that knows they need to get right with Jesus, we don't want to leave without giving you that opportunity. So. If you would just raise your hand, we would love to be able to pray with you. God bless you. I see you back there, man. God bless you right here in the middle. Yes, sir. Anybody else here this morning? That's what I'm just saying. I need to get right with the Lord. I know that heaven and hell is true. God bless you, buddy. Yes, I see you here. All the way in the back, I see you. Yes. God bless you. I see that hand just raised in the back as well in the middle. And all the way in the back on the, my left, you're right, I see you. More importantly, God sees all of you. And he knows your hand's gone up, and he knows that your heart is to be committed to him. And so I'm going to ask you to be able to pray out loud. The Bible says that if we confess Jesus before others, he'll confess us before the Father in heaven. And we, we want to give you that opportunity this morning. So I'm going to ask you to pray out loud. Just say, Lord Jesus, I heard you this morning. And I know that I need to get right with you. I'm asking you, forgive me of my sins and come into my life. And God, Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to empower me so that I might be victorious in those times of temptation. I commit my life to you. And I ask that you would be blessed and glorified in the way that I live. In Jesus' name, amen.